I've got it up and running now. So um, very, very kind introduction. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I'm not sure if, if everyone listens when, uh, when I publish something on data centers. I've got a, a, quite a few really uh, great colleagues who I've been working with back at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, which is where I started my career, uh, and Stanford and elsewhere, building and maintaining the, these models. Um, so what I wanted to do today uh, was give everyone kind of a peek below the hood at how data center energy models work. Um, they've been around for a while, and uh, every time you hear a number regarding data centers consuming X percent of world energy or emitting Y percent of, of greenhouse gas emissions, they generally come from, from models like the, the models I'll discuss today. Um, and so a question we often get asked in the field is, uh, are data centers unsustainable from an energy use and climate perspective? And probably everyone uh, in, in the presentation or on the Zoom has, has seen stories like the one, ones I'm showing. Uh, data centers are growing rapidly in terms of their energy use and, and uh, may soon be gobbling up lots of the world's electricity. Data centers are generally energy hogs, which are consuming more and more energy every year. Maybe you've heard news stories about the climate impacts of, of streaming video, or here's, here's a story that was on Channel 4 in the UK a few months ago about Instagram posts damaging the environment. We hear that uh, there's a big hidden impact to our online activities and that our, our online activities could be costing us the earth. Even things as mundane as email uh, are sometimes uh, painted as, as climate culprits. And if you've ever thought of a data center, most of you are probably thinking of something like this. So here is a very large data center. It's, it's over 70 megawatts. That's enough power capacity to meet the electricity needs of 50,000 homes. And there are hundreds and hundreds of these in the world, uh, especially hyperscale centers, data centers, which can be quite large. So this is one uh, of Facebook's large data centers. The truth is these are very efficient data centers. I'll get back to that next. But we generally think about data centers as being large, very energy intensive. We all know that we're spending a lot more time online than we used to, especially unfortunately due to the pandemic. And it's easy to connect those dots to say, wow, data centers must be consuming huge amounts of energy. And they're a real problem spot for uh, uh, not only for energy use, but for climate. Now, what I want everyone to understand is there are no official statistics that are compiled on data centers as a sector, meaning energy statistics. Most national governments collect energy data on the transport sector, the building sector. There's no such thing yet for data centers. So where do these energy numbers come from that we hear about? Um, some data center operators and tech companies are beginning to report their energy use. This is a great development in the last few years. So to the right here, I'm showing you some of the big players. Google does it, Microsoft does it, Facebook does it, some of the big uh, internet companies but also some of the large co-location companies, which are frankly just as large in terms of their, their, their data center floor area and their power use, companies like Digital Realty and, and Equinix. However, um, only really large companies are doing this and often they're not reporting their data center energy use. And you can see this down here uh, by way of the, the asterisks that I've put in. Some do, for example, Facebook's, Facebook gives us energy data and Apple does on, on each of their data centers. Um, but a lot of companies are reporting their organization energy use. That means, you know, Google has office buildings. They may have research labs and so forth. All of that is rolled into the energy totals. So it's not perfect, but it, it gives us an upper bound for some of the large tech companies and, and some interesting information for many others. But if I contrast this with uh, uh, where the, the model estimates are coming in, what you're going to notice is you've seen a big jump in scale here, right? Now suddenly it's an order of magnitude larger and all those company data points really shrank. And that's because there are many, many other data centers out there, thousands of them that don't report their energy use. They're either embedded in existing buildings on university campuses or, or, or so forth where they're not metered separately. A lot of data centers aren't really in, in organizations where um, uh, technology or, or internet services are their primary business activity. So for, for all of those other data centers, uh, we don't have reported data. And what that means is every number that you read about generally comes from a model. It's a modeled estimate. So there's a gap here that I'm pointing to between um, reported energy use and, and where the, the, the lowest uh, global totals are today. But there's also an enormous range of estimates that are out there. 
uh, it's, it's a, there's a factor of three difference basically uh, in the amount of, of energy use that's being estimated for data centers in 2018. So I'll talk about why do these values differ so greatly. Um, but let's start by just reviewing well, what is a data center and, and how does it use energy? So here I've got a figure of a really uh, simple uh, data center schematic where we can show the electrical consuming components. And, and you know, we generally divide the floor area up in, in the analyst community into two major chunks. One is the IT equipment. So these are the racks of servers and storage devices and all the network equipment that sends data around the data center and, and off into the internet. This is the IT equipment. This is the main purpose of a data center. Uh, this is where the compute happens, where the streaming video comes from and so forth. But there's a lot of other equipment in data centers, which we call infrastructure, that relates to providing, uh, you know, distributing power to the racks, UPSs or uninterruptible power supplies provide um, uh, a steady source of power in, in, in the event of an outage or, or a, a blip, uh, there's switch gear. Uh, and then there's a cooling system. All of this equipment, the IT equipment, but also uh, the power distribution equipment uh, has heat losses that pile up in the data center and have to be removed. And if we look at the general energy pie uh, uh, at, at a large scale, so what I'm showing you here is the latest national numbers we have for the United States from 2014. Um, why 2014? Well, these studies take a long time to conduct as I'll, I'll talk about next. But what we can see is a general breakdown where you know, at the US national level, it's estimated that uh, about 40% of the energy use in the data center sector goes into all of this infrastructure equipment uh, and about 60% goes into powering the IT equipment itself. And if we break out the infrastructure energy use, um, the lion's share, the vast majority goes into cooling, removing all of the heat from the IT devices, all of the heat from the, uh, the power losses in, uh, in, in the power chain uh, requires lots and lots of energy. So most of this infrastructure energy relates to the energy to cool a data center. So this is a, a general view of, of where energy goes in a data center. Any single data center may have a, have a different looking energy pie. This is at the national level, latest estimates for the United States. But it gives us some sense of, of priorities. So when we model data centers, we spend a lot of time modeling servers very carefully, also increasingly storage and also infrastructure. So what I'd like to do next is um, I'm gonna start at the top and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we model the infrastructure side of a data center, which is frankly the side that is uh, a little bit more, I, I don't wanna say straightforward, it's complex, but where, where, where basic theory gets us a long way. Uh, and then I'll move into talking about how we model the IT energy use. So um, let's do this. Let, let's talk about the infrastructure model modeling and, and then I'll maybe pause for questions to see if anyone has any. So, um, there's, there's a metric out there, any of you who have looked at data centers and their energy use may have heard of something called the PUE. The PUE stands for Power Usage Effectiveness. This is a metric that is uh, a standard one that's been in use now for, oh, about 15 years. And it's a simple metric that any data center can calculate, should they, should they choose so, uh, where uh, it's, the, it's the quotient, the ratio of total facility power. This is all of the power going into the data center divided by the uh, power going into the IT equipment itself. And since really what does the work in a data center is the denominator, the, 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 the scale of the, of the overall PUE gives us a sense of how efficient the infrastructure equipment is in a data center. So many data centers are starting to report this information. Uh, and the Uptime Institute is a longstanding think tank uh, and consultancy that does a lot of great work gathering uh, data from the, from the data center sector. So um, uh, regularly they, they report a lot of collected data from, from many uh, enterprise sized data centers uh, around the country, around the world. And what they've shown is that the average PUE in their, in their sample has, has come down quite dramatically uh, since the early days of of energy modeling, when, when data centers first started caring about their growing energy footprint, a lot of work has gone into reducing PUE. How do they do this? More efficient UPS systems and, and much more efficient cooling systems. 
But the Uptime Institute has found that PUE gains have really slowed for about, well, the last half or more decade of a decade, uh, hovering at about 1.6. That means that for every uh, uh, unit of uh, power, power that goes into the IT equipment, there's 1.6 units going into the overall data center. Um, so this is a success story, but it's also a challenge for the industry moving forward. Uh, big hyperscale operators like Facebook, like Google, who have regularly reported their PUEs as well, have found ways to drastically reduce that overhead energy use. How do they do it? Well, they, they use ultra efficient, often chillerless, chillerless uh, cooling systems that can bring their PUE down to right around 1.1 of the latest numbers coming from Google and, and Facebook. Um, and so there is an opportunity to get pretty close to the theoretical minimum through a really tightly engineered data center. And you know there are lots and lots of new dedicated data centers that have very low PUEs. Here's Switch, a large uh, innovative colo. But there are also some companies, notably IBM, I plotted them here, that run a lot of managed data centers, probably embedded in existing buildings, traditional enterprise type data centers, which still have fairly high PUEs. But why this is relevant for energy modeling is the more, we, the more data we get on PUE, the better we can model what's happening out there. And we're starting to do this through the use of physics-based models of, of PUE. So what I'm showing you here is a schematic of, of one cooling system um, based on a physics-based model that was developed by my PhD student, Noah Lay. Uh, so um, uh, he and, and other groups have developed uh, these physics-based models but we're really pleased with how well this one is performing. So the idea is that uh, since the PUE is, is mostly driven by cooling system efficiencies, uh, we can model with reasonable accuracy uh, mass and energy flows through a data center. That involves you know, water in and water out, um, uh, cool air from the outside coming in, what are its thermodynamic properties, what's the return air going out and so forth. So since we, we can model the physics of the system, we can get pretty good at actually modeling the PUE uh, of, of data centers, both at the, the single data center level and, and up to the average level nationally. And that's because the determinants of PUE are, are really well captured by models like this. So what determines a PUE? Well, probably no surprise, the type of cooling technology, whether a data center is using a chiller or an ultra efficient direct evaporator like Facebook or or Amazon or some of the other big players um, really has a big effect on, on how much energy they use on the infrastructure side. Uh, equipment factors like UPS efficiency, pump and fan efficiencies, we can model these in a physics-based uh, way uh, and we can tune those models by using readily available data that we get from equipment manufacturers or vendors. We also have to have some idea of, of how, that, how the, the cooling system is operated. So, a really important factor uh, is the, the, the set points, uh, are the set points. So what temperature and relative humidities are allowed inside the data center? The hotter we can run data centers, the less cooling we need. And some of the really cutting edge uh, data centers run really hot. They can run at 85, 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And at those temperatures, we require very little cooling. So we can get that sort of information from data center surveys like those conducted at uptime and so forth other industry reports, and then finally climate conditions, as you may imagine, play a role. Are you located in a hot climate or a humid climate versus a cold climate? That affects the data center's ability to use cool outside air directly and turn off their cooling system altogether. And we can establish climate conditions through readily available meteorological data. So I'm about to show you some results. Um, we've been fine tuning and validating the model based on US climate conditions for US data centers. And just so you can make sense of, of the results on the next slide, you need to kind of understand uh, these climate zone classifications. So the US is, is a, a really a wonderful place to run these models because we've got a lot of climate zones. We've got 16 unique climate zones uh, between uh, the different major categories and also whether they're moist, dry, or marine type environments. And these are all standardized by the IECC uh, climate, climate zone uh, classification. So this physics-based model uh, that we built and trained, um, what I'm showing you now on the left-hand side are validated results. Uh, so uh, 
I, I should put the scale up here. So the box plots show the, the median predicted by the model. Uh, the, the tails here show the, the, the 95th and, and 5th uh, percentiles. So these are uncertainty runs sweeping the entire parameter space. But what we care about is the median, because in general, for data center models, we're looking at the average annual PUE. And the X there, the green X, are reported values from five different real world data centers. So to model these data centers, we needed to know their locations, we needed to know their cooling types, we needed to have some idea about their UPS efficiencies, about their set points. Not a lot of data centers report that kind of information. But these large scale DCs are our hyperscale class. These are all running direct evaporative, air side economizer type cooling systems. Uh, the model did a pretty good job uh, of, of, of capturing the reported value through its predicted median, uh, only off by about five to 10%. For a midsize uh, data center, uh, this one here running a water cool chiller with a water side economizer, the model performed quite well. So because we can now model the physics of the, the systems, the airflow, the water flow, the temperature, the, 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 the thermodynamic properties uh, of the fluids, we're able to use these physics-based models to get a pretty good estimate of, of PUE of existing data centers. But since we capture the physics, we can also use these models for exploring potentials for reducing PUE in the future. And on the right-hand side, I won't really discuss this today, but uh, we can also, by capturing the mass and energy flows through these models, we can also now do a reasonable job of predicting WE, which is water usage effectiveness. It's the amount of water used at the data center per unit of IT power or energy consumption. So they can also help us understand a growing problem for the data center industry, which is, which is potentially a water use for uh, facilities that use uh, water cooled uh, chillers or other water intensive forms of cooling. Um, so this is the good news about data center energy modeling is that when it comes to modeling that 40% infrastructure or more, uh, these physics-based models can be pretty accurate. If we know the data center locations, their cooling system types, typical efficiency practices, we can get a pretty reasonable estimate for PUE. Um, we, and as more data centers report PUE, we'll have more accurate models. The, the caveats though, are that PUE is still uh, you know, less than half for most data centers, less than half of the energy use. And we expect that the PUE will become less important as part of the total energy pie moving forward with increasing shifts to the cloud and as existing data centers improve their, their cooling and power systems. And the biggest drawback is even if we can predict PUE, it doesn't tell us anything about the absolute energy use of a data, of a data center or of all data centers in a given region. And that's because it's a relative metric. It's, the power in over the useful power to, to IT equipment. And so to calculate the overall energy use or the power use, we need to know the IT uh, energy use. And, and that's what I'll talk about next. So maybe this is a good chance to pause to see if there are any quick questions regarding uh, the infrastructure side of data centers. And if not, I'm happy to keep going, but, but I, I'll pause here. So Eric, I didn't see anything in the chat, but uh, please feel free if you have a question at this point to unmute and uh, toss it out to Eric. There's a lot of folks dialed in, so, okay. All right, I guess. No worries, no worries. I'll take questions uh, uh, later and at the end as well. Okay, so now that we understand the importance of infrastructure energy use and, and how we model it in the, the energy analysis community, I'm going to move into the, the, the trickier side of the coin, which is modeling the IT equipment energy use within data centers. So um, the biggest contributor uh, historically has been servers. No surprise there. Anytime you stream a video, anytime you request a website, any, anytime uh, you're using a uh, business productivity software in the cloud, it's running on a server, right? So um, uh, how, does, how do servers use energy? So in order to analyze the, uh, the, the energy use of servers uh, in my community, we, we really need to understand a few key characteristics of servers. So one has to do with the, the power uh, and load characteristics of typical servers. So what I'm showing now are some reported data from Dell. Uh, this is for a typical volume server. Volume servers are the largest type of server used in the world. Uh, and Dell is one of the largest vendors of servers. 
Um, and what we can see is even at even at idle. So when the when the server is on and it's waiting to do a job, waiting for that request, it still uses quite a bit of power. That's because there's a fixed load for often for fans, for storage controllers, um, at, at idle mode in the in the CPU and so forth. And as we continue to load the server, um, we maintain that fixed load. But what happens is the CPU energy use goes up, and so too does the memory. Uh, which is probably no surprise. But what we find is we have this, this relationship between the utilization of servers uh, and the power that's being uh, required by each of their components and the overall power use uh, of the server itself. Uh, so understanding this relationships is one of the keys for, for, for accurate modeling of servers uh, in data center energy models. Uh, because like I said, servers correspond to uh, the, one of the largest shares of energy use in most data centers, uh, and they evolve very rapidly. Uh, and this profile depends on the number of cores, its generation, how much memory is required, the type of storage and so forth. So we really have to understand the evolution, not only of, of servers, but also of the components in servers. Uh, so how do we model? How do we model stocks of servers? So we're not so interested in modeling any individual server perfectly. What we care about in the sort of models that we build uh, are, is the energy use of large stocks of servers, meaning all the servers in the hyperscale segment in the US, or all the servers in server rooms uh, in the United States. But there are a few things we need to know. And uh, the way we build these models is by integrating a lot of different data types. Uh, so there are measured data, there are data coming from surveys, there are data coming from, from engineering estimates. They all come together to paint a picture of what we think is a reasonable estimate for server stocks. But one of the most important things to get right is the so-called power utilization curve. So I'm showing you kind of similar data here. On the, on the x-axis, we have the server workload. That's the capacity utilization. Uh, on, on, on the y-axis, we have the, the, the normalized server power. So one is the maximum draw at maximum utilization and zero is, is no power draw. And this dashed line represents perfect energy proportionality, which we're, we're not quite at yet. And you can see by, by following the color codes here that servers 10 years ago used to use a lot more pot power at idle. So you know 60% of the, the, the peak load was being drawn even when the server wasn't doing anything. It was just sitting there idle. Uh, if you follow the colors down, and these data come from a benchmarking database of efficient servers, it's, it's a spec power protocol, we can track over time the fact that uh, servers are, are gradually becoming more energy proportional, which is a good thing, um, but that it matters to know what this curve looks like, and it also matters to know uh, the vintage of servers installed. Um, the other thing we need to keep track of is the trends in computational efficiency over time. And these have truly been remarkable. So what you're seeing here are other data synthesized from the spec database. Again, these are very efficient servers, but we can see an order of magnitude increase in the, the overall, let's say, work output, the performance output, SSJ ops. Uh, this is the measurement unit for the test protocol divided by the sum of power. Uh, order of magnitude improvement over the years uh, in, in the amount of useful work we get out of a server per unit of power in. So understanding this evolution is also critical because any, any stock of servers, I'll show you here, is made up of, uh, of servers that are new, servers that are old, and servers that are very old. So we also have to keep track of uh, uh, things like refresh cycles for servers. Where do we get this information? This often comes from industry surveys. So Supermicro publishes an energy survey every year. Uptime does as well. Uh, and we get a sense of the refresh cycle. So maybe some of the hyperscalers are operating with, with very quick re refresh cycles, maybe every year or two. But there are many small data centers that have really long refresh cycles. So we, we have to synthesize this information into an age distribution because this matters when we want to model the power draw of, of each of those servers because they've been changing over time in terms of their utilization curve, but it also in terms of their computational efficiency. And the last thing I'll say is what's also really important and also a, a challenge in the analysis community is making reasonable assumptions about the average server that's installed in the average data center. What do I mean by that? Well, what I'm showing you here uh, are some, some comparisons of idle power draw. 
the, the light green, and I'm sorry if it's a, a little bit too light, uh, represents the spec database. So again, these are the most efficient servers uh, out there, and they tend to have really uh, uh, energy efficient operations and, and very low idle power draw. The Energy Star server spec is quite good, but it tends to cover a wider range of servers which have an, a higher idle power draw. And LBNL uh, conducted a big data scraping exercise where they, they looked at lots and lots of different standard servers sold from, from vendors like CDW online uh, and found that for those typical servers, the energy draw was much higher. And what does this mean? It means that we shouldn't be drawing conclusions based on the world's most efficient servers. Rather, we need to make sure that we're correcting for a lot of the typical servers that are off the shelf that are going out into uh, the rooms, the, the mid-scale data centers and so forth. So we do take this into account when we, we make our estimates of, of server power use. But you get a sense now of the sort of information we need to understand its evolution uh, and its average uh, power draw. Uh, it's a mixture of measurements, it's a mixture of market analysis, it's a mixture of surveys. And everything comes together into what we think is a reasonable uh, set of assumptions for the, the power utilization of different types of servers in different types of data centers. And what this looks like, here are some, exam some data again from the latest US data center study, um, which was completed in 2016 and, and its base year was 2014. But it allowed us to look at uh, different types of servers, uh, branded uh, servers, custom-made unbranded servers, one socket versus two socket servers, mid-range servers with a lot more processing horsepower and more memory, and even high-end servers, the ones that are more geared towards scientific computing applications and so forth. This is how we paint a picture of the, the overall energy use, um, but it takes the integration of, of all of those data that I just mentioned. Um, the second big area uh, that we need to cover in these models is storage and it's becoming more and more important every year. Why is that? Well, the world is creating lots more data. Here are some projections from, from IDC uh, and I think Seagate where they were looking at uh, the global data sphere uh, and they predicted that there'll be nearly a six fold increase in the amount of data created globally between 2018 and 2025. And, and a lot of this data will need to be stored. Uh, so how do we model storage stocks? Well. I'll be a bit briefer here, but we, we take a similar approach uh, as for servers, and we really try to understand the technology characteristics. So what I'm showing you on the right are some reported data from Dell. Uh, out of all the major equipment manufacturers, Dell has done a, a really great job of being transparent about the energy performance of their, their hardware. Uh, and we can see here that, again, it's the same story, the vintage matters and the type of device matters. So there have been really great efficiency gains over the last decade in solid state storage, but also in certain types of, of spindles, but fewer gains uh, at the really fast, the 15K spindle level. And, and, and so we need to understand what is the mix of different drive types? What are their vintages again? What are their power profiles? Uh, and it really takes understanding uh, those, those technology data, uh, but also how the stock has evolved. So what we're seeing is a gradual shift to SSDs and non-volatile memory. Uh, and these are data from, from IDC. They're, they're part retrospective and part forecasts, but it shows this expected shift uh, towards more and more SSDs in an enterprise data center environment. Um, and as I showed in the previous graph, SSDs can be really energy efficient, uh, but they're not made for every type of, of, of storage application. Um, so understanding this evolution is also pretty critical. Most drives are still hard disk drives out in, uh, in data centers, but we've seen this gradual shift to SSDs. What also matters is understanding storage management practices at the data center. This, is, uh, this relates to, well, what capacity utilization um, do we see on average in different types of data centers? And what I'm showing on the right are two graphs from, from Cisco's Global Cloud Index. Really what I just want you to do is to compare the, the, the Y axes the, the top graph shows Cisco's estimates for the installed storage capacity in data centers and how much of it is going to different types of applications. But they also estimated uh, uh, how much data is actually stored. So the top is capacity, the, 
The bottom is actual storage and it gives us a measure of capacity utilization. And it's generally between 30 and 70%, depending on I, I think the, uh, the year and the, and the application. So a lot of data centers are still running a lot of storage at low capacity utilization. But when a drive is spinning, it doesn't matter if, if, uh, if you're using it, if you're using all the bytes on it or, or only part of it, you're consuming the same energy. So what we also need to care about uh, is understanding store, tiered storage strategies and so forth, what's going on in real world data centers. And these, sort of, this, these sorts of data come from, again, measurements, manufacturer reports, market surveys, vendor, vendor data, market analyst data. So integrating all of this into a credible estimate is a big uh, part of the challenge for, for let's say, um, responsible data center energy modeling. Um, so let me, let me talk about the differences now. This is all leading up because I want to talk about uh, where all of this, this, this background work is going. Um, so uh, there are two types of models out there. Uh, one is called a bottom-up model. One class of model is called a bottom-up model. Uh, and the other is called a top-down model. What I've been talking about so far relates to the bottom-up modeling approach. So this is a depiction of the bottom-up model that was developed uh, at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Actually, when I, when, I, when I first got involved with data centers back in 2007 for the, the data center report to Congress, uh, I, I built, the, the, along with other colleagues, uh, an early incarnation of this model, and it's come a long way since then. But this is the model that was used for the 2016 US national report, and, and we further extended it to the global level. But you'll see, get a sense of, of, of where, uh, how these models work uh, and where the previous material is relevant here. So on the right-hand side, we have a lot of estimates of, of, of typical wattages for servers, for storage devices, estimates of PUE. All of these power and energy estimates come from the methods that I discussed previously. But there's a second equally important piece to these models, and that's an understanding how many servers are installed of different types. In what types of data center segments? Are they installed in hyperscale data centers? Are they installed in closets? How many drives are out there? How many are SSDs? How many are HHDs? Um, how many network ports and so forth? So the, the bottom-up models are a combination of, of, of energy uh, modeling, empirical measurements, and so forth, but they have to be coupled with stock estimates or installed-based estimates to roll them up to the, the regional or the national level. So these models are heavily reliant on market analyst data. There are some really great advantages to these types of models. As you probably can guess by now, they, they incorporate a really detailed technology rich level of analysis. So we can capture uh, technology change over time quite well. By modeling the system with this detail, we can have, we, the model has really great explanatory power. If the energy use changes over time, we can explain why. Is it more efficient servers? Is it lower PUE and so forth? Um, and because we capture the technology details, we can also use these models to explore, let's say, efficiency optima, so efficiency potentials. What if these data centers could improve their PUE? What if they could improve their server utilization? Models like this can answer those types of questions, but they also come with downsides. One is data requirements are really substantial, and, and they're becoming even, even more substantial as we look to uh, you know, emerging trends. The models are very resource and time intensive, time intensive to, to build and maintain. So studies don't come out all of that often. And the big Achilles heel often is that we need to rely on proprietary market analyst data for the installed base uh, of server storage and, and, and the other devices. Uh, and these can be very costly and often they can't be shared, meaning the models aren't as transparent as we'd like them to be. Um, so to give you a brief history of, 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 of where the estimates have come from, um, let's take a step back in time. So the very first estimates of global data center energy use were actually developed from a bottom-up model, and they were developed by my colleague, John Kumi. And he found that between 2000 and 2005, global data center energy use doubled. But then out between 2005 and 2010, uh, it didn't double. Efficiency started kicking in, and it only grew by about 50%. And this was, like I said, an early incarnation of a bottom-up model. It covered po coupled power data with, with market data for installed bases, but it didn't really cover the storage component. It didn't cover the, the network component, not explicitly. These were estimated by rough factors. And it assumed global average PUE values based on 
uh, limited data that were available in the public domain. So up until about 2010, these were the, the, the global numbers that we had to work with. Um, the problem was that that was the last bottom-up study the world saw for nearly a decade. And the world didn't stop caring about data centers because uh, they're really important. So what happened in the interim are that a lot of top-down type analyses emerged. So here's an example of, 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 of an energy trajectory that was predicted by a top-down model that I'm showing you on the right. It predicted uh, nearly a tripling of global data center energy use from 2010 to 2018. And if you look at the model by, by necessity, it was quite simple. There are only uh, three or four independent variables on the right-hand side. It's basically scaling up energy use on the basis of data traffic with some correction for efficiency improvements. So this is what's known as a top-down model. Um, another top-down model, which has been used and cited often, um, predicted a, nearly a four-fold increase in data center energy use. But if we take a look at the, the mathematical structure, we see it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, it scales up a base year energy uh, number uh, for data centers by an economic growth rate of 10%. So every year, this is growing by 10%. But if you look at these numbers, now you get a sense for why we're hearing about data centers growing rapidly, data centers uh, uh, consuming huge amounts of the, world energy, of the world's energy. Part of the problem is top-down methods can't capture the detailed technology change that bottom-up methods can, but bottom-up methods aren't employed as often as they should be, necessitating the use of more simplistic extrapolations. So we recognized this as a problem a couple of years ago. Uh, the fact that we didn't have bottom-up estimates since 2010, so we decided to extend this framework to the global level, uh, partly because uh, more and more top-down numbers were coming out, partly because there was growing interest among part policymakers, uh, and partly because we finally had a robust data source that was in the public domain in the form of Cisco's analysis. So Cisco has done a lot of wonderful analysis on data traffic and data centers. They provided a rich data set that we could use to try to um, develop a, a new bottom-up estimate of global data center energy use. Uh, and at the, at the global level, we saw uh, some of the same trends that top-down models would, would have us believe are leading to lots strong growth in, in, in energy use. For example, global data center uh, installed storage capacity increased by 25-fold since 2010. Data center traffic up by tenfold, workloads up by sixfold. Uh, when we extrapolate based on these trends, we always reach a really eye-popping large number in the future. But in parallel, based on the, the bottom-up view that we have by studying the technologies, we also know that in parallel, a lot of efficiency trends where we're, 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 we're counterbalancing the rise in demand for data services. PUE has improved. Uh, server efficiency, storage efficiencies have improved. These aren't just the result of synthesized estimates from the sources I mentioned earlier, but manufacturers like Dell for their product portfolios have reported really impressive efficiency gains in servers, this orange line, and in storage, this blue line, using only a fraction of the energy use they did at the start of the decade. Um, but most importantly, a big trend that occurred over this time frame was a lot of workloads shifted away from traditional data centers and toward cloud data centers. So what you're seeing here are Cisco's uh, estimates of, of global workloads in 2010, and then again in 2018, most of the, the growth in workloads occurred in the cloud. Why is that relevant? Cloud data centers have much lower PUEs. They tend to have really efficient servers that are operated at high capacity utilization, meaning the power per computation is lower than in, in, in traditional data centers. And we put all these trends together. What we found is that uh, even though we had a strong growth in workloads and compute instances, a six-fold increase between 2010 and 2018, that's this black bar here, overall data center energies globally uh, likely only grew modestly by less than 10%. The, the, this breakdown shows where that energy goes. So there is strong growth in the energy use of servers and also storage, uh, reflecting growing numbers and, and, and uh, more energy intensive devices. But those, that growth was moderated by a drop in the overall infrastructure energy use thanks to largely shifting those workloads, workloads to the cloud, this orange bar, and then to the hyperscale type data centers, the Facebooks, the Googles, the, the Azures, the AWS data centers, which have really low PUEs. That's a big explanatory factor for this, 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 this slow growth in, in overall data center energy use. 
And we also were able to, to model what was happening at the regional level. And I just want to say uh, how to interpret this last bit here, which is this, this double demand scenario. So by using this model, we were able to capture these enormous efficiency gains in PUE and server and, and storage performance and utilization and so forth. Uh, but we also know that some of those efficiency gains are slowing down with, with the slowing down of Moore's law. So the sole purpose of this double demand scenario was to say, we know we've got some remaining efficiency bandwidth for more shifts to the cloud, more efficient servers, higher capacity utilization in devices. What if we could seize that? How much, you know, how far into the future could we go without increasing energy use? And what we found was that it, it's technically possible, we think, to double computing workloads and in instances um, and maintain that plateau, but it would only come with maximizing the efficiency, remaining efficiency in all of those, the conventional hardware and data center practices. So it wasn't a prediction, it was a bandwidth a what if type scenario. Now we didn't know COVID was coming and we don't really know by how much workloads increased over in, in 2020, but certainly they went up with all of the zooming, all of the new streaming and so forth. So, but this was meant to show there is a lot of bandwidth left for improving efficiency uh, with the technologies we have, but it's not going to last forever. It has a limited shelf life. And beyond that, due to increases in demand from emerging applications, we have to figure out uh, another path forward, either by further technology innovation uh, uh, or, or from a climate perspective, shifting more data centers to renewable energy. So um, some quick caveats there, and then I'll, I'll pause for questions. And then I'd like to close with some priorities that I'm seeing as a data center energy modeler for where the field needs to go next. But the important caveats to that global analysis are that what, 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 what is most important was the retrospective nature of it. So we wanted to look back and say, listen, there were all these predictions saying that uh, starting in you know, 2010, we were gonna see a tripling or a quadrupling of data center energy use, but did that really happen? Is that possible given all of the, the technology trends? And we found it wasn't likely uh, given all of the, the, the efficiency improvements we were able to find. Um, uh, but there are some caveats to the study. Uh, a lot of the installed based numbers, the assumptions for workloads, virtualizations were coming from Cisco internal estimates. Uh, we trusted them, but we didn't have access to the, the primary assumptions. We didn't explicitly represent GPU processors. So what we might have done is miss the early phase of, of AI and specialized processor energy use. I've seen other studies that have come out since ours that, that suggest that that was a small chunk of energy use over the 2010 to 2018 timeframe. Today, however, it's a different story. Uh, we didn't include cryptocurrency mining. We treated that as a separate activity. What we focused on was conventional data centers. Uh, and based on the, 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 the segmentation that Cisco provided in their data, we, we couldn't determine, well, what is the edge? What's a closet? What's a room and so forth? But the main goal was we wanted to kickstart more activity um, by making our model open and our data sets available so that we can, we can move the needle on these kind of models. Because as I'll discuss in, in the next slides, after a brief pause, uh, the world look, will look a lot different in the next decade when it comes to data centers and the types of demands and the, and the types of compute that we'll see compared to the previous decade. The, 20, the last decade saw a lot of great efficiency gains. They're running out, potentially. Uh, there's a lot of innovation left in new technologies, but there's a lot of uncertainty moving forward where we need much better models. Uh, okay, let, let, let me see if there are any questions there about the results, the difference between top-down and bottom-up models and so forth. And then I'll wrap up with uh, talking about where the field needs to go. So do we have some questions from the audience? See, I have some of our colleagues from Microsoft and Facebook and other cloud companies on, online. So anybody have some questions? I, mean, I was wondering, does this model account for the energy that the additional transport energy to basically move the data from regional, regional smaller data centers into the cloud, into these hyperscale yeah. centers? It doesn't. So that's a really important system boundary issue. So this transition, uh, the shift from traditional to cloud, may, you're right, may involve more data traffic, but our boundaries were around the, the data center. So all the data centers you know, in the system, that's where our system boundary was. So when we, we see uh, network energy use here, which is quite small, this is just network equipment within the data center. 
The transmission of data around, you know, around the globe is another important aspect of internet energy use that is, has its own models and, and is facing its own challenges. Uh, but, but it was a scope limitation. Good question. Other, other questions? All right, Eric, I've got one for you. Um, sure. How concerned are you? There's a lot of this is like you don't have the data and you're doing your darndest to do the best yeah. job you can given that you don't have the data. Um, how do I say? It? How much of that is like known unknowns and how much of it is unknown unknowns? You know, I mean, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I know that you have some concerns. I just, can you articulate that a little bit? Yeah. Well, there are lots of known unknowns. A lot of the equipment assumptions are based on a limited set of data that we have to basically generalize. So what I didn't mention is uh, we, we've spent a long time developing networks among tech companies and hardware manufacturers and data center operators. So a lot of the due diligence that goes into creating these studies is, is vetting assumptions, asking if, if the results reflect personal experiences in their industry or data centers and so forth. So that's how we try to deal with the known unknowns, but we've been pushing for a long time for more data sharing and more data partnerships with, with the data center industry. It's, 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 it's something that needs to change because uh, a model, you know, there's a famous saying, all models are wrong, but some are useful, right? So every model comes with uncertainty. Um, and, uh, you know, we're well aware that th the chances of us predicting precisely the energy use of global data centers is really small, right? We think we're in the right ballpark. We think we've captured the right trends, but we don't really know. The unknown <laughs> unknowns have to do with, um, you know, mostly forward looking. So um, I have some data that I'll show. We're starting to, to see a little bit of data coming from the, the pandemic and, and how data center energy use fared. But we don't really know, um, uh, you know, how, how the world is going to, uh, you know, evolve in terms of where, where AI will go, what will it be applied to, what will 5G do to data, data demand and so forth. No one can really predict those things very well, which is why we tend to apply the models retrospectively. You'll notice we didn't go out very far and most modelers don't go out very far because the technology and the demand changes so rapidly. And that's really true today, but it is a challenge for the field uh, to get better at more forward-looking analysis that goes a little bit more out on a limb to, to give some insight into, well, what does AI mean? What, is, what does 5G mean? What does the edge mean? Yeah. That was actually going to be my next question is, what does the edge mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll talk a little bit about that in, in, when we talk about okay. uh, what the field needs to do moving forward. But as a quick aside, uh, there's some really good news from the U.S., and that is, uh, I show, you know, this is the modeling framework that, that, that we've worked with in the US and which we applied globally. Um, the last report was commissioned by the Department of Energy in 2015. But there's a provision in the Energy Act of 2020 to have a new, uh, 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 to revisit the study. So uh, I'm not quite sure yet uh, whether LBNL will do it again or where it will go, but it's there in the, the, the Energy Policy Act. So there will be an updated US study coming in the next year or two. Um, and hopefully it'll build upon this and expand it and look at some of the thorny questions that I'll raise. So, so that, that's helpful. It, it gives us the chance to have a lot more vetting with stakeholders uh, and to, to expand the model. Assuming, assuming LBNL works on it, we don't know. Yeah, so any other questions before Eric continues? Uh, yes, uh, I have a question. Uh, Lisa Stein is uh, from Facebook. Um, so because of all these great energy efficiency improvements in the past decade, I guess we'll get to see uh, the total energy consumption to sort of plateau at the global level. Have you looked at the uh, energy that goes into making of these digital technologies? The exergy is uh, the portion that I was talking about. I think uh, that portion is growing because the sheer volume of um, uh, electronics that's getting made over the years, right? Yeah, it's a great question. And you've, you've really hit on an important topic. So uh, when we think about the, all of the, the energy, the materials, the water, the, the, the greenhouse gas emissions that go into manufacturing all of the devices that underpin the internet, server, storage, network equipment, and then on the end user side, right? All the cell phones and, and, and devices and so forth we use to interact uh, with the internet with. Um, they're coming with a, 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 a non-trivial environmental footprint that is likely growing. 
So uh, there are colleagues in the field that, that study that issue quite closely. One colleague is Jens Malmedine. If, if you get in touch with me after the talk, I'll send you some of his papers where he's done some bounding analysis to try to understand how large is that contribution and, and where may it be headed in the future. But a number of companies are starting to report on so-called uh, scope three emissions uh, for, for their devices and they're, 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 they're substantial. <laughs> so it's another priority for the field is to start expanding the system boundary beyond just the data center to include the internet ecosystem, including all the manufacturing of all those devices and then the e-waste. So fast refresh cycles are great from a direct energy efficiency perspective, but they're probably not so great from an embodied impacts perspective because we're turning through all of that equipment uh, much more quickly. So it's a priority for the field to understand that tension and to see if there are some kind of optimal balances there. Cool, thanks. All right, so, um, so why, don't I, why don't I wrap up with just a few parting thoughts about models. So you have a sense of the caveats and, and uncertainties in a lot of these models. Now you have an understanding about the difference between bottom-up and top-down models and how bottom-up models are constructed and why you may hear numbers that are drastically different than the numbers I showed you here. Uh, generally, those come from, from models that don't take into account all of the technology, technological detail that's necessary to understand how energy use evolves. But moving forward, like I said, it, it's a different world. Why is that? Well, we know that on the efficiency side, uh, some of the efficiency gains are slowing down. There are only so many workloads we can shift to the cloud. There's only so low there PP we can go. Uh, and in general, servers are, our workloads are getting more compute intensive with more memory. But we do have a lot of innovations uh, that are out there on the horizon, like, like optical chips for, for much more power efficient computing. Uh, there's, there's one through liquid cooling technology for, for large data centers. Uh, network technology changes really rapidly and has some exciting potentials. Um, and as I'll discuss, there's a lot of room for efficiency improvements for software and algorithms. And what I've left out is quite important actually, and that is uh, it may be unavoidable that data centers need to use more energy, but we always have to think about the societal benefits of those services. Uh, and on net, if, 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 if data center services are, are saving more energy out there in the economy than the direct energy use of the data centers, it's still a win from, a, from an energy and climate perspective. But there are trends that uh, you know, are kind of keeping us up at night. One big one is artificial intelligence. Uh, another one is that you know, not all the world is connected. It's not all digi digitized, uh, digitalized. That's happening and it's gonna continue happening, especially as population increases and affluence increases. And we, we, we wanna make sure everyone's got access to technology and, and decent living standards. 5G may give us all much faster data speeds and get us consuming a lot more content, uh, leading to more data traffic, but also more workloads. There's of course blockchain, not just cryptocurrencies, but you know, other blockchain applications for energy trading and so forth. And then another issue is when we, when we can consume more data uh, and get more benefit from digital services, will we consume more? And that's what's known as a rebound effect. So one classic example uh, is, is autonomous vehicles. Uh, not so, not so you know, it's not so um, old, it's, it's just one that gets brought up a lot. Uh, and that is, you know, if we have autonomous vehicles, we can imagine uh, one bright future where they're all electrified, uh, they're running on renewable energy and so forth, uh, and, and everyone has access to them. But if we end up living farther away from the workplace, if we travel more, now we're using more energy and we need more renewable capacity and so forth. That's an example of a rebound effect because the hassle factor with driving has been reduced because now I have an autonomous vehicle where I can drink coffee or sleep in the morning on my way to work. So what are some priorities for getting a handle on this? And really it's going to be a balance moving forward. And I should mention the safety valve that the system has is renewable energy. And a lot of big companies are committing to renewable energy targets. Uh, but we also wanna minimize energy demand because that leads to lower capacity additions. And the fact is we have to electrify the rest of the economy, big chunks of it through renewable energy as well. So we need to do everything we can to keep energy use in check. So in my field, uh, we have a lot of priorities for improving the models. I'll just name five very quickly. The first is, is artificial intelligence. So uh, there's a growing concern about the energy intensity of artificial intelligence, meaning you know, the, the computational horsepower required to, to train models, uh, neural networks and so forth. 
there have been quite a few studies that show that uh, the amount of compute and the resulting amount of power is quite large, but it's still early days for AI. We don't quite understand yet, uh, you know, what's the optimal algorithmic efficiency? Um, how do we need to train a model? If we train a model, you know, is it, is it good to go and, and does it need to be retrained? How often and so forth? But there's also a lot of technology innovation. So uh, we have a lot of great work going on in, in optics here at UCSB. Uh, so I apologize for the MIT example, but you know I, I, I read about this a few months ago that you know optic photonic chips could run neural networks with you know orders and orders of magnitude less energy than electrical counterparts. So if AI does continue to take off, even if it's computationally intensive, there's also a lot of innovation in the hardware pipeline that could that could bend the curve, right? Uh, and there are a lot of beneficial applications to AI for society. So understanding that balance, understanding where demand's going, understanding the bandwidth we have, and understanding what technologies could, could come into play to, to moderate uh, AI's uh, energy demand in the future is, is a big priority. Uh, we can't do it yet with our existing models. Second big priority is the edge. Uh, you know, uh, IoT uh, and, and potentially 5G getting all of us to consume more content. So 2020 was a really anomalous year with the pandemic. None of us saw it coming. Uh, and there's been a lot of talk about, well, what did all that internet activity do for energy use and climate change? And mostly what we read is the increase in data traffic probably led to a big jump in energy use. As an aside, we're not seeing that on the network side. So now we're starting to see 2020 data being reported by internet, by tech companies and internet operators. We've seen some data already from network operators that show they absorbed a huge spike in data traffic with no increase in energy use. Why is that? Well, the networks operate with a really kind of flat power profile. Uh, it doesn't vary much based on data throughput. It's designed for peak capacity and they, they get efficient, more efficient every year. But the data center side of the internet uh, is a big black box. So um, Akamai uh, released their sustainability report and they reported that um, at least in the early months following the, the, the pandemic, that their traffic requests doubled. So that's what we are expecting with people consuming a lot more content. And they've released their energy data. Uh, and I've got the link to the report here if anyone's interested in it. But basically the takeaway is um, they absorbed what could be about a doubling in, in requests for, for data. Uh, they had to expand their, their network capacity out on the edge, but it ended up being about a 40% rise in energy use. So potentially double demand for a 40% rise in energy use. And what it tells us is that yes, there will be implications for more uh, content being uh, hosted at and consumed at the edge as we, we, we use more content in CDNs and we have more IoT devices out there, but that there's definitely not a one-to-one -one proportionality between the demand for those services and the energy use of the data centers. Uh, and here are some recent 2020 data uh, that gives us some insight into what happened in data centers due to, due to COVID. But understanding the edge is really important because it's going to be a big component of the internet of the future. Third priority is our models don't, don't represent software explicitly. In, in fact, it's kind of a blind spot in the way we model uh, the energy use of, of servers. Uh, and the reason is we focus on workloads and utilization levels, but we don't really understand What's, what's actually being run? What is the software? What is the application and how efficient is it? So there's a wonderful article here. It's called, um, uh, there's plenty of room at the top. It appeared in science uh, last year uh, where the article discusses that as Moore's law tends to slow down, uh, if we think it will, who knows, um, there may be less room at the bottom, meaning in the hardware to, to get uh, energy efficiency gains, but there's still lots of room at the top, meaning there's a lot of bloat in software. Can we design better algorithms to do the computational job that we need uh, that are much more efficient? And are there strategies for pairing algorithms with specific hardware that's, that's, that, that's simple and, and what we need for that particular job? So they argue that there's a lot of room for energy savings through, through all of these software efficiencies and our models don't take, into account, take this into account really at all presently. A workload is a workload. A capacity utilization level is a capacity utilization level. We don't know how much bandwidth there is uh, related to software improvements. So that's the third priority. The fourth one is quite quick. Uh, we need to get a lot better at gathering empirical data. So we have to rely on reported data sets like spec, but they don't cover the full spectrum of devices that are out there. We need to get a better understanding of how energy use varies with 
different types of server configurations, different applications and workloads, uh, different power management strategies. If, if the power management is turned off by the customer once they buy the server, what does that mean for the power utilization curve? What we tend to see in the spec database is you know, the ideal condition. Uh, best available versus typical hardware, I discussed that. And importantly, getting an early view of new technologies and approaches is really important. Our models have all been retrospective to date. And the ones that are, that are prospective looking out into the future are generally really simplistic. We need to get better at understanding how new technologies, new algorithms, optical chips, advanced liquid cooling, what's the energy performance? How do we model those to give a sense of what their role could be for mitigating energy demand in the future? And, and the last priority is one that I, I say often, and I hope industry is listening, um, is that we, we really need, uh, the analyst community needs, needs better industry data partnerships. So PUE reporting is wonderful. Um, aggregate level energy use reporting is wonderful. But as we look to make our models more relevant for the future, they're going to become a lot more complex. And with that complexity will come increases in data requirements, increases in known unknowns, no doubt, and, and probably unknown unknowns. But a lot of the data we need to have accurate models relate to the amount of installed compute, hosted workloads, what hardware is, can, you know, what, is it, what does the hardware configuration look like out there in real data centers? And these are closely guarded secrets, but there could be a happy medium. So there are some industries that have moved to uh, a, a model where uh, they have third party data sharing. So for this industry, what seems really important is that we come up with some overall efficiency metrics that are uh, that, that can be released annually, quarterly, whatever, that reflect the real world installed equipment in data centers and their utilization. And that can be reported in the aggregate that, that won't reveal any particular company's you know, proprietary data, but rather will give policymakers, analysts, the public an idea of, of how energy use is trending in the industry and how efficiency is trending. That could be done through confidential kind of third party relationships where some independent confidential arbiter gets the data and doesn't share it with anyone in the network and produces the overall metrics. There is a call to develop metrics in the Energy Act for 2020, which is exciting. So maybe some of this will come as a result of that work. And clearly more, more partnerships between academic analysts uh, like those in my research community and, and the tech industry and even the, 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 the labs that are innovating new technologies is really critical. There's, there, right now, those data flows don't happen as often as they should. But to tackle the, the sort of, you know, the analysis challenges we need to tackle moving forward to provide the right numbers to stakeholders, the models certainly need to improve. But right now, there's a tremendous data barrier that, that we all need to work on. Okay, with that, I'm sorry, I went a little over. Uh, I should wrap up. Thank you very much for your attention. I can stick around for questions if anyone has them, but I really appreciate your attendance. And uh, if, you have, if you have questions offline, send me an email. I'd be happy to, to connect that way. Yeah, Eric, it's okay. I mean, like, if people want to stick around, there's no hard stop at five. We, we often go to 515, 520, so whatever okay. works for folks. So uh, with that, I uh, would love to take some questions. Uh, So questions from the audience? Unmute yourself. And, um, well, Eric, I, I, I want to make a comment and then perhaps ask it as a question. So what, what Moore's Law did was train a generation of software engineers to be happy, you know, knowing that, that, that performance would go up and costs were going to come down. And they could just write, with functionality was everything, right? Unless you were in like the, uh, you know, uh, the you know uh, cellular phone industry and you know you, you knew you had a battery in the limited life and all that uh, so I, I thought your point was really well taken about this the software thing and this thing that was in you know the nature article uh, it, it just absolutely is true from that from that that industry for sure um, and it, consumers are trained that way too you think computers phones TVs all this stuff are always going to come down in price and it's only the last five years that you're seeing, you know, a flattening in some of those things. But. Yeah, no, I've, we've heard about it for many years and we know it's there, uh, but quantifying is, is, is pretty tough. So, um, but it does seem to be a, one of the next frontiers, especially as, you know, in a, in a carbon constrained world, uh, energy uh, will, the price will increase, there'll be more scrutiny. A lot of companies are committing to science-based targets to, to decarbonize. 
So there's going to have to be a hard look at this piece, I think, pretty soon, which is, yeah. which, which is, which is also kind of exciting. I think it's overdue, as you, as you, you kind of suggest. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, any anything else from folks? Uh, Eric, thank you so much. That was wonderful. I uh, appreciate it. And I, I'll tell you, there were a lot of industry folks who are on from a lot of the companies that you were talking about. So maybe they'll take back your message of, uh, help, you know, helping with getting the data and all that. And we, maybe we can talk to you about that offline, about maybe sure. talk, talk with some of those companies as we go along. That'd be great. Well, it was my pleasure. Um, and uh, thanks everyone for attending. So thanks. All right. okay, thank you. Bye. Bye.